I mean, not good morning, it's the third talk in the session, but I hope you, at this point, you're all energized. So it's a great pleasure to have Noam Brown uh, from Facebook AI, who's going to talk about uh, uh, yeah, deep reinforcement learning and other uh, uh, applications of learning in games. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is um, on combining deep reinforcement learning uh, and search for imperfect information games. Um, the motivation here is that we want to create an algorithm kind of like alpha zero or alpha, you know, alpha zero, but that can also play imperfect information games like poker. So uh, for some background, um, I'm sure many of you know, or pretty much all of you know about AlphaGo. AlphaGo is this milestone achievement in AI. It was the first time that an AI had beaten top humans in the game of Go. Um, that said, there were some things that were not so satisfying about AlphaGo. Um, one, it used human data. And two, it used expert features. Um, so arguably the more impressive achievement was followed up a year later with Alpha Zero. So Alpha Zero is a single algorithm that can play chess, Go, and Shogi and without any human data and no expert features. So um, I, I think this is a very impressive achievement. Uh, that said, it is limited to perfect information games. Alpha Zero is not able to play an imperfect information game like poker. Um, and you know, I'm sure that well, the question is, well, why? Uh, and I'll, I'll cover that in a little bit. And this is, of course, a problem because perfect information games are a very limited subset of the whole space of games. Um, you know, perfect information games are games where all players know the exact state of the world. They both observe the same thing. But in a lot of real world situations, you have situations where there's asymmetry in what players observe. Uh, and so, for example, a lot of real world situations like negotiations, financial markets, um, international trade, all of these can be observed, all of these can be viewed or modeled as imperfect information games that involve hidden information. So it'd be nice to have an algorithm that can handle hidden information because eventually we want to extend these beyond just recreational board games into the real world. Now, when it comes to imperfect information games, the standard benchmark um, and grand challenge for a long time was poker. Um, in 2017, uh, my advisor and I made a Bot that played two player Texas Hold'em poker and was able to beat top humans. Uh, this was followed up in 2019 with a six player bot that was able to beat top humans. Um, that said, the techniques that were used in these poker AIs were very different from the ones that were used um, to play games like chess and Go. Uh, and so we have this situation where there's Alpha Zero, which can play a lot of perfect information games, but can't play poker. And we have these AIs that can play poker, but you, know, you could run them in a game like Go, but it wouldn't do very well. Uh, so can we have a single AI that can play both Go and poker um, and, and a lot of other games, ideally, all using the same algorithm and at a strong or expert human level? And so that's the motivation behind Rebel, uh, which we actually published in NeurIPS 2020. Um, Rebel stands for Recursive Belief-Based Learning. Uh, Rebel provably converges to a Nash equilibrium in two-player zero-sum games. So it's a minimax, the same thing as a minimax equilibrium. Um, it is superhuman in two-player no-limit Texas Hold'em poker, and it uses far less domain knowledge than any prior poker bot. And in perfect information games, Rebel reduces to an algorithm that's very similar to Alpha Zero. It's not quite identical, but um, it's, it's much closer than anything that's come before. Okay, so I want to start with a simplified overview of Alpha Zero, and then I'll talk about Rebel. So to start with, we have to define what is a state in a game. So a state is a sufficient statistic. It contains all the information that's needed in order to determine the optimal next move uh, in the game, assuming that both players are gonna play optimally. Now in a game like chess or Go, a state is pretty much equivalent to a picture of the board. Um, it's not exactly the same. So for example, in Go, there's this co-rule where you can't repeat the same board configuration. Um, uh, and so you can't just look at it you can't just input the exist the, the, the current board into uh, your, your bot because it won't know if that board state has been repeated or not. Um, and this is also a thing in chess. So in chess, I think if you, um, you can't repeat the same board position three times or there's a draw, so you have to feed in a, a few different snapshots uh, of the previous board states as well. Um, that said, um, in general, when it comes to perfect information games, you can just feed in a picture of the board and that you can call that the, the state. Um, in the worst case, a state in a perfect information game could be the entire sequence of actions that were played. Um, okay, so that's a state. Now, in perfect information games, the value of a state is the unique value, and this value is unique, 
of, of both players playing optimally from that point forward. So for example, if you were to look at this chessboard and ask what is the value for player white? Well, the answer is white, assuming that it's white's turn to act, let's say. So white can move their, their queen to uh, take the black bishop and that's checkmate. So the value for this state is one for white because they're gonna win. And so a value network takes a state as input and outputs an estimate of the state value. Now, where does the value network come from? Well, there's a few different options. So one, it could be a handcrafted heuristic function. This was used, for example, in Deep Blue in their chess bot, uh, in, their chess bot in 1997. Uh, it can be learned by training on expert human games. So you, you know, train on a bunch of human data, um, feed in a board state, see what the end game outcome ended up being for these human players. That's how AlphaGo was trained. Or it can be learned through self-play. So you have the bot play against itself, see who ends up winning, and then you can use that information to train the board states that were encountered. And so that was used in alpha zero. Okay. Now, when it comes to a game like chess or go, in principle, you could just solve the entire game uh, in, in one go, right? Like in theory, you could just do backward induction um, and, and figure out the optimal strategy for the entire game. The problem is that games like chess or go are way too large to be able to do that. Um, and so what ends up happening instead is search. So, the idea of search is you look some number of moves ahead, let's say five moves ahead, you stop there and then you substitute a value estimate of both players playing perfectly from that point forward. You substitute the state value. Um, and then you're only gonna solve this sub game. Um, so for example, you can do backward induction, um, alpha zero uses Monte Carlo tree search. The details of how this uh, search is performed is not too important, but all these search algorithms um, have this high level framework. And if the value net is perfect, then this will compute the optimal next move for you to take. And you can just keep doing this recursively as you go down the game tree. And that's how you can, can play these games. Um, now in alpha zero, the sub game grows in size because they use Monte Carlo tree search. Um, in principle, Rebel can do the same. That said, for simplicity, um, we assume that the sub game is fixed in size. Um, and for this talk, I'll, I'll make the same assumption. It just, everything still carries over. It just makes things a little bit more complicated. So you can imagine a subgame that's containing every state that's reachable in the next five moves. Okay, so the way alpha zero works is at the start of the game, it's going to generate a subgame. And this is how it's both trained and how it plays. Um, it's gonna generate a subgame, and then it's going to solve this subgame, assuming that the leaf nodes, the, the nodes at the bottom of this subgame have a value determined by its value network. Okay, so it solves the subgame, that determines the next move. Um, and then it just repeats this process as it goes down the game tree. Um, next move generates a subgame, solves that. That determines the next move, keeps going until you reach the end of the game. And then eventually you see somebody wins, let's say blue. And so now you're going to um, use that final payoff, the fact that blue won, as a training example for all of the states that you encountered. And with some random exploration, Alpha Zero will eventually encounter every single state and learn every state's true value. And so for this reason, alpha zero, um, at least there is a form of it that provably converges to the min max equilibrium in a perfect information game. Okay, so that's great, but why doesn't this work in imperfect information games? Actually, I, sh I should say before I go forward, is there any questions about how alpha zero works? Okay, yeah, question? I mean, when the state space is too large. Yeah, this is more of a theoretical result that it's not actually going to explore all of the states in, in the state space, but it's going to use a neural network function approximation to be able to generalize between similar states. Okay, so why does this work in imperfect information games? Well, the reason is that perfect information states, as traditionally defined, uh, don't have unique values in imperfect information games. So let me give you an example. Uh, this is a toy game that um, I call Rock, Paper, Scissors Plus. So it is just like Rock, Paper, Scissors, except if either player throws scissors, then the winner receives two points and the loser loses two points. And this is just to break the symmetry of the game. And I'm showing here a sequential version of the game where player one acts and then player two acts without observing what player one did. So you see there's a player one decision node where they choose between Rock, Paper, and Scissors, and then it goes to player two, and then pl player two acts, and there's a dotted line between the player two nodes which signifies 
that player two doesn't know which of those states, those, uh, those nodes they are in. Okay, now if you crunch the numbers, the Nash equilibrium, the minimax equilibrium for this game is to choose rock and paper with 40% probability and scissors with 20% probability. And if both players do that, then they both receive a payoff, an expectation of zero. Now imagine we're gonna, imagine we try to do search in this game. We do a depth limited form of search. Um, and what does that look like? Well, this is what the sub game is going to look like. Player one, well, let's say we're just searching one move ahead. So player one acts, we look one move ahead, we stop there and we substitute a value estimate of both players playing perfectly from that point forward. So this is what the sub game would look like. It's player one, they choose between rock, paper, and scissors. And then there's a payoff of zero and the game ends. Now, the problem here is that there is not enough information in this sub game to determine player one's optimal strategy. Um, player one might look at this and conclude they could do one third, one third, one third. They could always throw a rock, but there's not enough information to arrive at the minimax policy of rock and paper with 40% probability, scissors with 20% probability. So what's going wrong here? Well, um, the problem is that we are assuming that player two's policy is going to be fixed regardless of what player one does. And indeed, if that were true, if player two were to always play the Nash equilibrium, regardless of what player one does, then player one could throw a rock with 100% probability and receive an expected value of zero. But that's not what would actually happen. If player one were, for example, to throw rock with 80% probability, then player two would shift their, their, their strategy. They would start to always throw paper and the value of the rock action would change. It would become minus one. Um, now we're making an assumption here, uh, which is that our, our algorithm is common knowledge. So if, so we're assuming that um, the other player has access to our code and they can see that our policy is to throw rock with 80% probability. Um, and so therefore they are able to best respond to it. And that, that, that is an important assumption that we're gonna be making. Um, and it's actually a common assumption that's made in game theory. Um, that said, we are also going to assume they don't have access to our random seed. So if we have a randomized algorithm, then they won't be able to know which action we're actually choosing. Now, I wanna point out, this is, I think the key difference between perfect information games and imperfect information games. In, in an imperfect information game, the value of an action changes um, depending on the probability is chosen. That's not true in a game like chess or Go. In a game like chess, if an action is good, it doesn't matter if you choose it 10% of the time or 100% of the time, it's gonna have the same expected value. That's not true in a game like poker. And this also means that these, these nodes um, don't have unique values. The value depends on the policy both before and after. Okay. Uh, so for information sets, does the holder not to not like information sets? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna just not to get to that. Uh, information sets don't necessarily have unique values, um, but there is an extension of a uh, more general, a more general form that does have unique values, and so that's that's what we're gonna end up using. Uh, okay, so how do we fix this? Well, yeah. So just to follow up on on that question. Um, what we have to do is redefine a state. Remember, a state has to be a sufficient statistic. It has to contain all the information that's necessary to determine the optimal next move. Um, and so just asking what is the value of throwing rock, that's not well defined. There's not enough information there to determine the value of, of that state. Um, so what's, if you ask what's the value of having thrown rock, there's not enough information there. Um, but if you were to ask what is the value of having thrown rock with 80% probability, paper with 10% probability, scissors with 10% probability, that value is well-defined, and that value is, in this case, negative 0.6. Um, and so, so this is how we're going to overcome this problem. We're going to, gener we're going to extend the, uh, the definition of a state to include the common knowledge um, belief uh, probability distribution, the joint probability distribution over all relevant nodes in the game tree. Now, in this simple example, we only need to have a uh, probability distribution over one player's nodes. In the more complicated case uh, where the game is, is longer, there's decisions that have to be made by both players, you actually need the joint probability distribution uh, over, over nodes. So you need a probability distribution for both players. Okay, so that's the high level idea of Rebel. Um, this, this, is, this is gonna be like a key ingredient to Rebel and now I'll get into the overview of Rebel. Any questions about this so far? Yep. Yeah. 
the joint probability distribution over all players. Is this always a product distribution of my information product with your information? It, it's not independent, if that's what you're asking. Um, it, it can be, it can be uh, dependent. So for example, in poker, if I have an ace, if I have a high probability of having an ace, then your probability of having an ace is lower. And so it's actually dependent. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is a way to decompose it so that, uh, well, this is kind of a detail, but there is a way to, to, to compress it. Okay. So now it gets a rebel. Um, so before, okay, so start off with, we need to go over regret minimization. Um, I'm going to hope that a lot of you are familiar with this because I'm going to go through it quickly. Um, the idea behind regret minimization is that um, on each iteration T, an adversary is going to pick uh, a hidden payoff for each, uh, for each action in the game. And then we're going to pick a policy, which is a probability distribution over actions that we can play. And after we do that, we receive a payoff, um, which is the probability of each action. It, it's the way it times the, uh, you know, just the vector product of like the probability distribution times the utilities. And our goal is we want to do at least as well as about as well as the single best action that we could have taken in all the previous iterations. So we're going to define regret as the utility of the regret of an action as the utility of that action on all of the iterations minus the utility that we've actually received on all the iterations that have been played. And if we're not talking about regret of an action, we're just talking about regret in general, we're going to say it's the maximum re regret over all the actions. Now, a very useful property is that if the average regret, that is the, regret, the sum of the regrets divided by the number of iterations is less than or equal to epsilon for both players in a two player zero sum game, then the average policies uh, of both players over all the iterations, the average over all the iterations is a two epsilon minimax equilibrium. So this is how we converge to minimax equilibria. We minimize regret for both players over all these iterations. Um, and one thing that is gonna be really important for later um, it's the average policies that converge, not the final iterate, but the average. Um, that said, playing, playing an action from the average um, policy is identical to just sampling a random iteration and then sampling an action from that iteration. So that, that's actually gonna be pretty important later. Okay, so what does this look like uh, concretely? Well, let's take a look at this rock, paper, scissors matrix game. So we have player one choosing a row of rock, paper, scissors, player two choosing a column. And I'm showing here just the payoffs for player one, because this is a two-player zero-sum game. So whatever player one receives, player two is going to receive the opposite. OK, so in regret matching, player one is going to choose a probability distribution over actions. Let's say one half rock, 25% paper or scissors. Player two uh, picks an action. Let's say they choose scissors in this case. And their choice determines a payoff for each of player one's actions. Um, so player one for rock gets a payoff of one, for paper gets a payoff of minus one, for scissors gets a payoff of zero. And now we update the regrets for each of those actions. So the regret for rock increases by the value that they could have received for choosing rock with 100% probability minus the, the, minus the value that they actually received. So one minus uh, 0 0.25, the regret goes up by 0 .0 0 0.75. And you can update the regrets the same way for paper and scissors. And now, because the regret is higher, um, you know, you're kind of like have some regret for having not played that in previous iterations. Now, there's this algorithm called regret matching. Um, and there's actually a lot of algorithms that, that can minimize regret. But uh, the one that I'll, I'll talk about right now is regret matching, uh, which just says if you, you should pick actions proportional to the amount of positive regret on those actions. And there's a theorem that says if you do this, if you pick uh, a probability distribution over actions in this way, then your regret will be bounded, uh, your average regret will be bounded by uh, roughly order one over square root t. So if both players play regret matching, then their regrets are going to, average regrets are going to decrease um, and eventually will converge to a minimax equilibrium. Okay, so that's a review of the regret learning, regret matching. Um, what about extensive form games, sequential games? So counterfactual regret minimization is a generalization. It's an extension of uh, regret minimization to uh, sequential games. Now, the idea here is that we have uh, what are called info, set, info states, um, also known as info sets. Um, and an info state is a player's decision point in the game tree defined by their, obs their observed actions and their uh, and uh, just observations in general. 
So their actions and their, ob and their observations. So for example, uh, this node right here at the start of the game is its own decision point. It's its, uh, its own info state. These two nodes here, uh, because there's a dotted line, which means that player, two, player one did not observe which of these two actions player two chose. And so these two, these two nodes share an info state. Um, so CFR is going to independently minimize regret at each info state. What that means is for each of these info states, you're going to have a regret value for each action left or right here. Um, because player one doesn't know which of these two nodes they are in, their, their strategy, their policy has to always be the same for both of those nodes. And that means that the regrets for both of those nodes are also, also have to be the same. So player one for this, this, for this info state has two regret values, one for going left in both of these nodes and one for going right in both of these nodes. So every single info state in this game is going to have its own uh, regret minimizer, its own uh, regret value for each of its actions. And they are independently going to run something like regret matching. And counterfactual regret minimization is a, a way of modifying this so that the regret for the entire game is bounded by the sum of the regrets at each of the info states. It's, it's a little bit more than that. Um, it involves some like weighing of how the regrets, uh, um, how the regret values are weighed. Um, but besides that, it's basically it's basically that. Yes, you just run independent regret minimizers at every single state. Okay. So this allows us to extend uh, regret minimization to sequential games. Um, now, there's this algorithm called CFRD that was introduced in, uh, in 2014. And this ends up being quite useful for Rebel. Um, OK, so the idea here is that regret matching is one way to bound the growth of regret. But it's not the only way. Um, the, the important thing about counterfactual regret minimization is that it says the regret for the entire game is bounded by the sum of the regrets for all the info states. Now, it doesn't matter how you keep the regrets for those individual info states low. As long as they are kept low, the sum of the, the regret for the entire game will also be kept low. Um, and so there are a lot of ways that we could keep the regrets low. Um, what we do in CFRD, uh, I'm going to try to keep this intuitive, which is we're going to break up this game tree into two levels. So we have, uh, we're just going to like draw this black line, break it up into two levels. And on the top side of this line, in all the info states above this line, we're going to just run CFR as usual. And for the info states below this line, we are going to compute a policy that has zero regret for all the info states below that line. Um, so info states on the first level, we choose CFR. And because we're running CFR independently, like, CF, like whenever you're running regret, a regret minimization algorithm, um, it doesn't matter what you do in the other info states. If you run regret matching in, a, in an info state, that info state's regret is going to be bounded by order one over square root t, regardless of what happens everywhere else in the game tree. So all of these info states above this line are going to have regret that's bounded by order one over square root t because they are running CFR there. And the info states below this line, we are explicitly computing a policy that has zero regret on every single iteration. And so of course, their regrets are also bounded. Um, now, of course, this seems kind of silly because you know, the whole point of running an algorithm like CFR is to try to compute uh, a policy that has zero regret everywhere. Um, and so now you're saying like, well, on each CFR iteration, we have to solve a part of this game tree, which seems like a, a very expensive operation. And yes, it is. The original motivation for this algorithm was to reduce the, the memory usage of the algorithm um, at the cost of increasing the computational complexity by quite a bit. Um, but where we're going to end up going with this is that we can use function approximation to eliminate this inner loop of, of having to solve these, these nodes down here. Um, and it ends up being quite computationally efficient. Yeah. I'm confused about what zero regret policy means, given that uh, the top part of the tree is not stationary. It's, it's learning at the same place. So you're, you're learning a, yeah. So I was going to say, yeah. So you're learning a 
and has zero instantaneous regret. So you're learning um, a policy, you're finding a policy that has zero regret conditional on the policies that are played above that line. Should I think of it as a two loops of like two loop of it, like you like the top part chooses the uh, all this is then because, like, I don't know how you weigh the nodes in an information set with what you just said. Yeah, can you explain a little bit? Yeah, so I'll um, yeah. actually go through an example, maybe that'll help. Yeah. Okay, so on each iteration, uh, for the info states on the first level, like above this black line, you're just going to set their policies according to whatever CFR says to do. So let's say that's something like this you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and then uh, player two sets their, their policies the same way. This is just done based on the regrets of those nodes. And then uh, below that line, okay. So given these policies for these players, you have some probability distribution over each of these nodes, right? You can work out the math and it says there's a 12.5% chance that you're in this node, 37.5% chance that you're in this node, and so on. And so now we're going to compute a policy that's optimal given that information. So in that case, um, that's going to be in, these, in this info state, well, you're usually in this right node, and so you go. You should go left um, with 100% probability. And in this info state, you're usually in this left node, and so you should go right. I uh, should go right with 100% probability. Now, this policy um, is going to ensure that your regret is always uh, non-positive, right? Because if you then update your regrets for each of these info states, like the regret here is is your regret update is going to be zero. You know, you're, you're choosing the best action that you could have received for that iteration. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So this is still going to convert to a minimax equilibrium because the regrets on the first level are bounded as usual by CFR. And the regrets on the second level are always non-positive. Now, there's, there is um, one thing I should point out here. So I, I'm keeping this kind of simple in that all these nodes down here belong to player one. So it's really easy to compute what the optimal policy is. Now, if you have more like both player one and player two nodes, essentially you have to solve a, a sub game. Um, and how do you do that? Well, you do that by just running CFR. You know, you can recursively run the same algorithm for all uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the bottom level. And yeah, like I said, that's very expensive, but just bear with me, it'll make more sense as, as we get a little farther. Okay. So now I wanna talk about decomposition. Um, given the policies on the first level, the second level can be decomposed into subgames that can be solved separately. So given these policies on the top line, down here, this is a subgame. The, the, the optimal policy in this, in this info state has nothing to do with the optimal policy in this info state. They can be solved completely independently. Um, and so this is what we call a subgame. It's it's a piece of the game that is uh, can be you can compute the optimal policy independent from another part of the game tree. Now, um, in particular, I'm going to define a public belief state as a joint probability distribution over nodes at the root of a subgame. So here, the uh, public belief state is 12.5% you know, on this node, 37.5% uh, on this node, and then you normalize so that it all sums to one. And again, in a more complicated setting, you'd have to have the joint probability distribution for, um, uh, for all the nodes. And it could, they could belong to like multiple players, for example. So uh, another question. How do you define subjects in the sense uh, if there are more players than below? For example, imagine that kind of like in the left blob that you have there and the right blob that you have there. Further down the tree, there's an information set for player two that you know connects one node from here to a node from there. Then these are not subjects anymore. You have to put them all together. That's right, yes. If you have terms, I se sever this top part and uh, I add the connect. Uh, dotted lines, and then I find connected components, and these are my subjects. That's right, yeah. So you, the subjects have to be, a yeah, subject has to be its own, uh, completely separate from, from the other parts of the game tree. Uh, and so th this happens a lot, actually. So in a game like, you know, in a lot of recreational games, there's public actions. And so, you know, if somebody publicly takes one action, then everything that happens after that point, you can solve completely separately from uh, something that happened after a different public action.
um, conditional on knowing the probability that that public action was taken. Um, and so that's what we're doing here. We're saying like conditional on knowing these probabilities, we can solve this part of the game tree completely separately from this part of the game tree. Now, there are some games where you don't have um, this, this, these public actions and you can't decompose the game tree. And uh, there, it's still an open question about what you do to, uh, to be able to solve pieces of the game. Um, but, but this ends up being quite useful for a lot of, a lot of situations. Or like if there's an imperfect recall. Yeah. Yeah. Imperfect recall is also a bit, yeah, a big problem. Um, okay. So public belief state is a joint probability distribution over nodes at the root of a subgame. And uh, the nice thing about public belief states is that they end up being equivalent. They, they share a lot of properties with perfect information states as we previously defined them. So a perfect information game state, remember like think about a chessboard, um, has a unique value if both players play optimally from that point forward. Well, same thing with public belief states. Um, a public belief state has a unique value for, uh, for that subgame. Like each subgame has a unique value. Um, and that ends up, yeah. So that's how we train our value network. Um, remember, like the whole challenge here was that we, we didn't have unique values before, but now we do. So what we can do is train a value network to predict the value of subgames rooted at a public belief state. So the input to this value network is a public belief state that is a joint probability distribution over nodes. And the output is the value of the public belief state. Now, uh, there's a subtlety here, which is that even though the value of the public belief state is unique, um, the value of the nodes or the info states at the root of that public belief state of, of that subgame are not necessarily unique. Um, we address this in the paper, but it's kind of complicated. So I will, I will just gloss over this for now. Um, okay, so that's how we get our value net. And how do we train the value net? Well, we do it the same way as alpha zero, we do it through self-play. So this is what the algorithm ends up looking like. Um, we start at the beginning of the game with an initial public release state, which is just you know, determined by the initial rules of the game. Uh, we generate a subgame, and then we solve it using CFR. And then at the bottom of this game tree, at uh, the bottom of this subgame, there's going to be a leaf public release states. We will get the values of that. Instead, think of again, like CFRD, normally we would do this recursive CFR call where we solve uh, the subgame on each iteration of, of CFR. Instead, we're going to query our value network and ask it, what is the value of the subgame? And it's going to output a value. Um, and that's how we're going to, to solve this subgame. And again, I meant uh, going back earlier, I said the average strategy of CFR converges to an equilibrium, but you can equivalently just choose a random iteration and, and sample from that random iteration. So that's what we end up doing. We're going to stop this operation on a random iteration, um, play the subgame policy on that random iteration, and that leads us to a leaf public belief state. Now we repeat this process. We generate a new subgame, solve it um, using CFR, um, play that policy on a random iteration, and keep going all the way down the game tree until we reach the end of the game. And then eventually we get a, an outcome, something like blue wins. And so then we use that value as a training example for all of the public belief states that we encountered. Uh, all the way down the game tree. And this looks very similar to how alpha zero looks. And in fact, if you run this on a perfect information game, it, it's, it's very similar to alpha zero. Um, you know, states end up, public belief states end up collapsing to the traditional definition of state um, as defined in perfect information games. Um, the training is very similar. And we have a theorem that says, uh, with tabular tracking of public belief state values, Rebel will converge to a Nash equilibrium, a minimax equilibrium in two player zero sum games in a finite time. Um, and yeah, so it'll converge to a one over T, one over square root T minimax equilibrium, where T is the number of CFR iterations that you run in each subgame. Okay, questions about that? Yeah. What about the constant in this uh, convergence rate? The constraint? No, sorry, the constant in the convergence rate. Is there the number of states or something like this? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so there's, uh, there's, there's a pretty big constant that's attached to it. So I should say, like, order one is for a key. Um, and yes, in practice, of course, you don't actually want to tabularly track the public release state values. 
Um, you want to use neural network function approximation in the regular value function and also ideally a policy network to be able to generalize between similar similar states. So when uh, you generate the sub game, all the leaves of that tree must be PBSs, like uh, because yeah. you're not including your network from PBSs. Right? Uh, so all these networks there are PBSs. Yeah. So you hope that uh, whatever game you play has is likely to lead you to a at least small size tree that has PBSs. Yeah, I mean, a public like every game has a public leaf state. It's just a question of how big it is. Um, so, I mean, like the whole game is itself a, uh, sorry, every game has a sub game. It's just a question of how big that sub game is and how big the root of that sub game is. So, like, you know, the whole game, for example, is, is a sub game. And, um, you know, it might be that there's only like five sub games in this whole game, in which case this is, yeah, going to be a problem to run. Uh, but that's, that's, you know, one of the interesting directions for future work. Like, what do you do when these plug belief states are massive and um, you can't plug them into a value network easily? So the network would have to generalize across the sizes of PBSs. I mean, like, uh, yeah, if, uh, does that make sense? Like, uh, yeah. So conveniently in poker, which is the game that we ran this on, uh, all the public belief states have a roughly the same size. So the public belief state in poker would be a probability distribution over the hands that you can have, and the probability distribution over hands that I can have, and also like the public publicly observed sequence of actions, and so. The number of possible hands that I can have or that you can have stays fixed pretty much throughout the entire game. Um, there's always going to be roughly 1,326 possible hands. So, yeah, you don't really have to generalize over different sizes um, in poker. Now, that said, again, yeah, there's still interesting questions about how do you generalize this to even more complicated settings where, like, the size of the, of the PBSs can change throughout the game um, or in different parts of the game tree. Okay. Yeah. Um, could you do something similar for games that are cooperative? Like, uh, yes. I mean, I actually did do something like this uh, for for Hanabi, um, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later. Okay. So, uh, what do the empirical results look like? So, we actually played this against both prior poker bots and we played it against a top human professional. Um, so. In terms of uh, comparison to prior bots, it's very close to state of the art. It doesn't quite beat Libratus, which is the bot that beat top humans in uh, two player no limit poker in 2017. By the way, this is all for, for two player no limit Texas Hold'em poker. Um, you can see Rebel. The main benchmark here is Baby Tartini and Eight. This was the champion of the 2016 annual computer poker competition, which is our bot actually. So Libratus beats it by 63 plus or minus 14 uh, chips per hand. Rebel beats it by nine. That said, when you compare it to top humans, Libratus beat the top humans by 147 plus or minus 39 chips per hand. Um, Rebel beats them, beats one of them, the best performing one, by 165 plus or minus 69. Now, I am uh, hesitant to claim that Rebel is actually better than Libratus. In fact, I don't think that's the case. I think this is just an example of variance um, playing a part. Um, but I think there is, it's quite clear that at the very least, Rebel is. Uh, beating uh, this top human professional and by a pretty substantial margin. Why didn't you play Rebel versus Libratus? Uh, I couldn't have access to the source code. Of what? You might and, it well, I don't own it though. <laughs> it's, uh, it's at CMU. This was done at, at Facebook. Rebel was done at Facebook. And then also, Libratus is very expensive to operate. So Rebel runs on, you actually don't even need a GPU. You can run it on like, you know, a, C, on a few CPUs. Uh, CPU cores. Libratus takes about 2,000 CPU cores to run. So it's it's pretty difficult to get enough hands in to, to measure that. Um, okay, we also, I mean, again, the nice thing about Rebel and the whole point of Rebel is that it's general, it's generalizable. It, it, it's a uh, general. It can be applied to other games as well. And so we actually ran this also in Liar's Dice. Um, and again, there, there's not really benchmark bots that we can play against, but we do show empirically that it converges um, to a to an equilibrium in, in this game. Um, and in fact, we open source the bot and you can download it and play around with it uh, at this URL. Okay, so one thing I should point out also regarding the poker results, um, even though Rebel, I would say, is not as strong as Libratus, um, Libratus used a lot of domain knowledge to, to achieve its level of performance. Um, it used information about, you know, what hands are similar 
um, a lot of feature engineering. Um, Rebel basically does none of that. And it takes out a lot of that stuff. Um, it still discretizes the action space. That's the one thing I would say like the biggest use of domain knowledge. But besides that, it's actually quite minimal. And so that's really what we're aiming for with this, with this paper. Could you comment on the types of platforms that are used in Rebel, as in, like, you know, in AlphaGo, visual aspects of the board are important in the first few, like, there are, the, it's a, the, the prefix is a complement of the value and action network. Um, uh, so here, is it the fully connected, la like, layers? What is the... That's a good question. So um, I'm a little rusty on the details of that. My collaborator was the one that was mostly responsible for the uh, uh, network architecture. Um, I feel like even if I give an answer, the answer would probably be different today. Like the optimal choice would be different today than what it was two years ago. Um, so I don't, yeah, I can't really comment on that right now. Uh, okay, so key takeaways. Uh, Rebel currently converges to an action equilibrium in two players versus some games. That is a minimax equilibrium. And this is true for both perfect information and imperfect information games. Uh, Rebel achieves superhuman performance in poker while using far less domain knowledge than any prior poker bot. And Rebel reduces to an algorithm similar to AlphaZero in perfect information games. Now, that said, there are some major challenges that remain. Uh, so one is um, how to deal with more hidden information. So the input to Rebel's state value function is a probability, a joint probability distribution over all info states that are that are feasible, that are consistent with um, the the sequence of actions that have occurred in the game so far, the public the public uh, information. Now, in Texas Hold'em Poker, there is one thousand three hundred twenty six possible hands, and so the input to your value network is at most two thousand six hundred fifty two for heads up poker. But what do we do if there's far more hidden information? You know, what if you have five card poker, five card draw poker, or what if you have a game like Stratego? Where you have you know these forty different units that could be arranged in any possible configuration, um, you can't just plug in a forty factorial distribution into a into a into a neural network. Um, so that's one challenge. We've actually had two paper recent papers that address this problem. Um, one was published at Neurops in twenty twenty one, and so this is on scalable online planning via reinforcement learning fine tuning. The idea here is that we replace tabular search techniques with a uh, neural network um, kind of like reinforcement learning operation, a fine tuning operation that happens at test time. And we also have a paper that's going to be presented at iClear in a couple months on a fine tuning approach to belief state modeling. So this addresses the question of like, what do you do um, if the number of possible in, uh, you know, info states or nodes is too large to feed into a, into a value network? Um, we show that you can actually have a generative belief model that will be able to sample from that distribution. And we can fine tune that model um, while doing search. And this actually, we do experiments on Hanabi and we show that, um, that this actually achieves state-of-the-art performance in Hanabi and can be extended to versions of Hanabi that have far more uh, like seven cards instead of five because it can handle the increase in information. Uh, finally, I think another interesting challenge is um, learning the dynamics model. So there is a recent paper that came out um, called Mu Zero, where it's an extension of Alpha Zero that learns to play games like chess and Go without even knowing the rules of the game. Um, I thought this was a really impressive achievement, especially because it makes it much more useful for the real world, where sometimes the rules are not so well defined as they are in chess and Go. Um, it's a, still an open question of can we extend Rebel to do something similar? And finally, um, going beyond two player zero sum games remains a very interesting challenge. And this is something that I personally have been working on and I, I'm very excited about as well. Okay, so I will stop there and um, take questions with the little time I have left. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Any questions? Start with one. Uh, while waiting, uh, so, um, could you comment a little bit? I mean, uh, uh, say a little more about the last uh, point you made about multiplayer games. Like, what is the state of the art there in terms of uh, I don't know poker or other games? So uh, poker 
poker has a unique structure. So we, we were able to make a superhuman bot for six player poker, um, but that's because poker has a very adversarial structure to it that makes it very difficult for players to cooperate. And I don't think that the techniques would extend to all, or they certainly don't extend to all uh, multiplayer games out of the box. They, they extend to some, but certainly not all. And so I've been work, looking at this game, Diplomacy, um, which involves a lot of collaboration in addition to competition. Um, there, the state of the art is, um, you know, there's still a lot of open questions. Um, it's not even clear what solution concept we're really looking for. In two player zero sum games, there's the minimax equilibrium, which has this nice property that says you're going to beat any, any other player guaranteed in the long run. If you're, or at least you're not gonna to lose to them if you play the minimax equilibrium. Um, once you go beyond two player zero sum games, you don't have that, that theoretical guarantee anymore for any of the equilibrium concepts. And so I would argue that um, what you need to do is look at um, data on the population of players that you might be up against. So collecting human data and being able to leverage that human data and incorporating that into these kinds of algorithms is quite a difficult challenge. So, so for multiplayer poker, it does it does not end up being kind of like running uh, counterfactual regret, or it is so. In multiplayer poker, we do actually yeah just run CFR. So we take techniques that are pretty similar to the two player zero sum techniques, um, scale them up, make them more efficient at some uh, new new techniques, and we show that that works in six player poker. Um, so so there's the solution because of some kind of correlated equilibrium ultimately. What is I think in practice it ends up converging pretty close to a Nash equilibrium. Um, technically, it is a course correlated equilibrium, though. Yeah, um, and I, I think that the fact that that works is, I think, arguably a quirk of poker. Any further questions? Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.